Well, it's early spring, probably April, and we are, we're getting tired as producers, I think, of feeding hay, and, and we may be running short on forage. Um, and the cows, quite honestly, are looking across the fence that maybe some spring grass is starting to break dormancy. Um, you know, so our topic today is going to be, you know, when should I turn out? I'm Dr. Ron Lemonade, your beef extension specialist in the Department of Animal Science at Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana. And I'm Keith Johnson. I am the Purdue University Extension Forage Specialist based out of West Lafayette, Indiana. Keith, you know, we're, we're, we're dressed a little different today. We are. Okay, uh, when I got up this morning, it was uh, cold enough to put on ski pants, okay, when I was doing chores. And uh, you're dressed in short sleeve shirt today. Well, I looked uh, at the weather forecast, and uh, they said it was going to be in the mid-60s, and I thought it'd be hot dressed like you. So, yeah, we've got that time of the year that it starts cool and can get warm, but you know, the last few weeks of this particular season, it has been extremely cold. And I'm hearing that there are some people that don't have enough hay in inventory. So let's, let's, let's start out then talking in this discussion about, you know, this early growing season condition and what, how does that affect the forages and what do we need to be thinking about? Well, essentially, if you will, if the temperature doesn't get above 45 or 50 degrees during the day and it's cold at night, it's essentially like being in a refrigerator. Not much is going to happen in regards to growth. And so we need to start getting temperatures that are consistently, you know, above 55 degrees uh, during the day and probably not dipping below 30s at night to really have an accentuation of growth. And again, there are some seasons that we think it's time to graze, but the forage says not yet. Well, what about the, the ground conditions? As the, kind of the other piece of that, right? You know, so what do we need to be thinking about there in terms of its effect on the plant? Well, when we have saturated soil conditions, we do have to have oxygen in that soil to have proper root growth, which then mm -hmm. grows the forage above ground. And when the when the soil is saturated, there's just not much oxygen there to grow roots to start the process of, of growth. So uh, the other thing is when we start early and grazing and uh, when the soil is saturated, we can have some really extreme hoof action that can do long-term damage to those plants, uh, maybe even more than this particular season if we're not careful. So what's the ramifications then? I mean, what, you know, if, if I've trampled up my, my pastures and I've, I've kind of hurt the growth of those plants, what's likely to happen as the season goes on with those disturbed areas of soil? Well, essentially, you have a plant that's trying to recover if we let it, but at that particular season, it's going to be one that's going to lag behind, and productivity is not going to be what it could have been if we wouldn't have been out there grazing too early on too wet a soil. Is it a likelihood that weeds will start to pop up? And now that you've kind of broken that seed surface and got down into maybe some, what we always used to refer to as a seed bank, sure. if you will. Well, weeds can be opportunistic. And when you're opening up a nice tight sod because of hoof action, uh, it definitely does allow what seed may be in that upper few inches of soil to, to grow. And a good portion of that probably is going to be some weeds that we don't want to have part of our pasture. So we've got this short harvested feed, and we know that the pastures aren't quite ready for grazing. What are some options that we can, can do to let the grass grow, to let the soil firm up? What, what are some things that we can do? Well, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of a delayed turnout, right? And so, you know, I think as a producer, you've got a couple options. One of them is you can sure go out and you can buy hay, all right? And I think that that's one of the expensive options. Uh, but it's sure an option, and I think, you know, you've got to be a little bit careful of that uh, when you're buying hay. Uh, not only the expense, but also the forage quality that you're getting. You know, are you buying somebody else's weeds that are going to come back? We might, I might have a short-term solution, but I may have a long-term problem with that. So don't just look for volume, but yeah. look for quality of the product. I, I think so, and, and I guess I would take maybe even a low-quality forage that doesn't have weeds in it, if I can do that, because I can supplement around it, okay? Uh, that, too, is an expensive option, okay? I mean, the higher the quality of the hay, the closer we come to meeting the requirements of the animal, 
you know, and, and so it's, you know, is the combination of a low quality forage and a supplement cheaper than buying a higher quality hay to start with? So I, I guess I would recommend that producers, if you're buying hay, hay in general, but, but particularly if you're buying hay, you know, to get it tested, all right, so that you can minimize how much supplemental feeds you're putting into these cows uh, to meet their requirements and not overfeeding, but also not underfeeding because both of those are expensive options well, as certain, well. Certainly with a spring calving herd, you're going to need higher quality feed too because they're okay. lactating for that calf. So, so kind of a second option would be to limit feed hay, all okay. right? And, and, uh, and when you limit feed, unless it's a really, really high quality forage, you're probably going to have to supplement it as well. Uh, but it is a way to extend your forage supply. And then probably the third option would be to cull those non-productive cows. So if you've got some cows that somewhere aborted along the way during the winter, you know, and, and she's not going to have a calf, or maybe it's the cow that lost her calf. Uh, you know, maybe there's a few cows at the bottom end of the herd that, uh, you know, you might even be able to sell as a cow-calf pair. So right? essentially you have fewer mouths to feed during right. that particular time. Just to, to reduce the needs on your forage inventory. Right, yeah. So what about, uh, why not just feed corn? We've got plenty of corn. That Couldn't that be part of the diet? Well, and, and corn sure is, uh, I mean, we've, I mean, it's been the traditional feed, okay? If you look back in time, you know, I grew up feeding corn. I mean, that's what we did, yeah. all right? The, the challenge with corn is that if I feed more than about 0.3% of body weight, so a 1,200-pound cow, that's about 3.6 pounds, right. all right? When I have to go above that, I put so much starch in the rumen that it drops the rumen pH, and that is not conducive to really good fiber digestion of the forage component of the ration. So I, I, I like to, for producers to at least consider uh, using a high fiber feed and things that, like soybean hulls, like corn gluten feed, uh, or combinations of those. Uh, the challenge, I think, is that, you know, if you feed straight corn gluten, maybe you're feeding too much protein, all right? I mean, we run that risk. Uh, and that could have some negative implications on reproduction. Right. So I like to think in terms of combinations. And we here in Indiana, at least, we've got a number of our producers that are feeding a 50-50 blend of soybean hulls and gluten. Uh, that's kind of a nice utility feed, okay? I can feed it to developing heifers. I can feed it to cows. I can feed it to my bulls. Uh, probably not a feedlot finishing ration, but it does work really, really well on the female and the reproduction side of our, of our operation. So kind of summarize then, Ron, for producers in this cold spring, just a couple of key points related to feeding, feeding them until we do get grass that's at least four or five inches tall. Well, I mean, I think, you know, limit feeding is sure a, a very viable option, um, you know, to be able to stretch that supply. Yes, I'm probably going to, more than likely, unless my hay quality is really, really high, I'm probably going to have to think about supplemental feeds. I would prefer, okay, if that number gets up above, you know, three and a half, four pounds of needed supplement, that we probably start to think about more of a high fiber supplement uh, as opposed to just pure corn. Right. Well, very good. Keith, any last comments, any thoughts that, you know, we haven't talked about on this particular topic? Well, and I think one of the lessons here is no season is exactly alike. Uh, you'll find that some years that you'll be turning out 10 days earlier than what you might think it ought to be, and some days it's going to be two weeks extended, and it all depends what Mother Nature provides in terms of moisture and temperature, and so one needs to be aware, and so don't necessarily live by the calendar to a fault, but certainly take into consideration the growth of the grass in terms of the right turnout time. I agree. Well, I think that wraps up our discussion of when producers should consider turnout to pasture uh, at the beginning of the grazing season, and we thank you for joining us.